Lord, we thank you for bringing brothers like this. We thank you for your word. We just ask that you are free to lead and speak through Jason this morning. and Just let your will be done. I thank you for who you've created Jason to be. And I just ask that your spirit is free to flow out of Jason in your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Awful quiet. <laughs> Don't make me nervous. You're quiet. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm privileged to be here as well. It's kind of a hot mic, a little bit of a hot mic. You just touch me down just a little bit. Uh, glad to be here. Excited to be here. Where is the worship leader? They, they, they have set out. When he comes back in, can you bring him back to me, please? I got something for him. I got a, or actually, the Lord has something for him. Let me say it differently. I am uh, Jason. If you don't know me, J Jason O'Neill. I am from uh, normally from originally from Gary. I live here in uh, Goshen on the south side. We run a ministry called Link Ministries. It's Life and Covenant, traveling the nation. And the world trying to teach people how to walk life in covenant. Amen. We're supposed to be in covenant in the body of Christ. We're supposed to be in this together and not doing it separate. We're supposed to be walking together. And so uh, we are an urban missions organization, which means that we go into some of the hard hit areas uh, where the church is kind of afraid to go. Amen. <laughs> you wouldn't think that the church would be afraid to go anywhere, but there are some places that the church is afraid to go. So we spend a majority of our time on the south side of Chicago. And if you watch the news at all, which I don't watch hardly any news, but if you hear anything in the papers or on Facebook, there are a considerable amount of homicides on the south side of Chicago. Uh, throughout the summer, uh, they'll, they'll get up to 60, 80 homicides just in a weekend. Amen. And so we uh, feel like we are compelled to go into the American cities. We were in Kenosha, Wisconsin, right after uh, the enemy marched through Kenosha, Wisconsin and tried to burn it to the ground. We were there three days later, boots on the ground and, and uh, winning the loss, uh, meeting the leaders of some of these organizations that if I said their names, you would know them. And uh, we got to meet the leader of BLM, we got to come into contact with some Antifa guys and uh, hey man they're just unclaimed sons of God amen, amen. amen. <laughs> let me say that one more time <laughs> they are actually just unclaimed sons of God man they don't know their identity they do not know who they are and because of that they are frustrated and running the streets and breaking things and doing things and God is calling us to go out in the highways and the byways and compel them to come to Christ. Amen? Amen. And when they turn, they are one of the most powerful people because they've got no care. They've already been doing crazy things. So when God calls them to crazy, amen, they won't worry about it. They, they'll just go out and do it. They'll do whatever the Lord tells them to do. Amen? amen. So pray for them. Don't curse them. Pray for them. And pray for those of us that are going out in the streets and going after them. Amen? So we do that. We go after them. We have a, a team, a small team of a, a just on fire uh, men and women who, who will go out and do what God calls us to do. We just try to do the following of the leading of the Lord. And so pray for us in ministry. And if God compels you to sow into that, if God compels you to sow into that, then do, then do so. Man, thank you so much. What is your name? Uh, Jared. Jared. Thank you, Jared. Um, uh, I, many of you guys know this, but uh, the, the worship and the ministry work hand in hand together. And uh, you pray and you believe and you hear from the Spirit of the Lord. And so you put a song list together. And, and you're asking the Lord, God, what are you wanting to lead us in worship today? And I'm over here praying and fumbling around and trying to find the, 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 what the Lord's trying to say. Yeah. And, uh, but you ministered to me today 
because, man, you are right on course. I thought he was going to preach my message, to be honest. I know, I know pastors, preachers say that all the time, but I'm serious right now, man. Like, you started testifying, and I'm like, well, there, here's my Bible. <laughs> so I just, uh, because you have blessed me, I want to bless you. Put your hands out. Uh, Jordan, come on up here for a second. This is my son, Jordan. God, I just, I just want to bless right now. Stretch your hands out this way. I just want to bless this man of God. And I want to bless his mouth, his throat. I want to bless his inner man. I want to bless his spirit, man. God, strengthen him, raise him up. God, he knows who he is in you. He knows who he is in you. All the years of uh, struggle and strife and attack and all the things that the enemy has tried to do to him, we just, we just shake all that off. We just wipe all that off of him. Years of, of uh, worry and anxiety. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Years of worry and anxiety of how it was going to go and his placement. God, we just wipe all that off of him. And God, I just pray that even today the fire from heaven would fall on him and light him up like never before. God, I just pray for dreams and visions, more dreams and more visions, more dreams and more visions. God, that finance would come into his hand, that that wouldn't even be a worry anymore, that God, you would bless him in a way he would understand that it is you, God, that gives good gifts because you're a good, good father, not based on his... Mm, not based on who he is or if he does it right or does it wrong. God, but because based on who you are, yes. giving good gifts to him, God, pour finance into his life. Let that stop being, stop being a worry. <laughs> and then, God, I pray that you open up the international door to him. I pray, God, that you would send him Send him like you've sent so many of us, God. Show him, whether it be in a dream or show him in a vision or show him, God, through an uh, encounter that he meets somebody. Send him, Lord. Send him. We are the sent ones because the gift that you have inside of him, God, is, is needed in a lot of different areas. The peace that he brings through worship is needed. So, Father, we just pray as he's saying new wine, we pray for new songs, new sound. Let new sound come out of him. All right. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Bless you, man. Bless you, man. Give the Lord a hand, somebody. There you go. All right. Ah, all right. I have spent the last couple days in the beautiful city of Chicago with my wife and my oldest daughter. My oldest daughter turned 18 on Thursday. Ouch. <laughs> every dad in the room, every dad in the room felt that just a little bit. It's like, ouch. She's a beautiful woman of God. She loves, she loves God. God has made her artistic uh, and she worships. She does guitar, she does paint, she does drawing, she does writing. I mean, just like, what does she not do? She kind of intimidates me sometimes because I'm like, well, I, I slid through high school. <laughs> like I was on a sled, you know, and <laughs> I wasn't saved by no means. So I was trying to figure it out and I wasn't figuring it out very well. And uh, so she is brilliant and I wanted the opportunity, my wife and I wanted the opportunity to bless her uh, bless her socks off. So we had a good time the last couple of days. We were there till late last night, came in this morning. But I just, I know God's got something for this house. God's got something for this house today. Okay? I'm not going to take up all your time. It's okay. But I want you to just be with me while I'm here. Here? I want you to be with me and locked in while I'm here. I don't know when it was, a few weeks back. Um, they say, what, six weeks ago I was here and I ministered uh, before, six, eight weeks ago, something like that. Usually I don't get a callback very quick. Usually the callback will come the next year or something like that. Uh, the pastor in the ministry will say, hey, man, we want you back. We want you to come back. <clears throat> and so uh, I was surprised, kind of surprised, to get a call from Pastor Robert and say, hey, the leadership, we've talked about it. And, Man, we just want you back. And so I was excited. I said, yeah, absolutely, because I have a heart for this region. And I see God doing some powerful things 
in the spirit in this region. And there's, a, there's an awakening that's happening. There's a revival that's happening in this region. Uh, Michiana is on fire in the glory, whether you know that or not. Michiana is having an outpouring right now unlike any other. And no, you are not seeing stadiums being filled. You are not seeing massive church nights where there's thousands being uh, brought together like in Revive. But I'm telling you, God is doing something in Michiana on a grassroots level. Everywhere we go, everybody we talk to, God's doing something. There's miracle signs and wonders happening right now in Michiana. So if you don't know anything about it, you got to start searching because things are happening here. It's the season, it's the time. I tell people all the time, shut the television off and go get with believers and hear from the Lord what he is doing rather what the world is doing. Amen? It's important. So I got a call from Pastor Robert and said, come on, and uh, uh, the date, this date worked out on our schedule. Uh, December is absolutely gone. Our December is booked. I've got no more time to do really anything. Uh, everybody's saying, don't say yes to nothing else <laughs> unless the Lord says. So uh, we are booked in December, but we this date was open. I felt like the Lord said yes. Several weeks ago, we, we, we scheduled it. And then I get a call yesterday from Pastor Robert, and he told me about what happened to his eye. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. Then let's do this thing. <laughs> because we as a ministry, and I don't say this arrogantly, we as a ministry have been taught by the Lord how to get into the fight, get into attack. When we go to a city, I don't ask a lot about the city. I don't even get on Google and try to find out uh, what the city looks like or what's going on in the city. When we went to uh, Jamaica and we went to Montego Bay, everybody kept saying, man, Montego Bay is so beautiful. You ought to, you ought to look at it. And I was like, no, I don't want to look at anything to do with uh, uh, anywhere we go because I don't want me to get in the way of what God wants to do. I want to go with a clean slate. Amen? I want to hear from Him. I want to go where He wants us to go. I don't want to go where the tourists want to go. I want to go where He wants us to go. And it's a good thing that I did not get online and look up Montego Bay because online is all the resorts and all the cruises and everything else. Man, that is not where we went. We went up in the mountains where there's no running water, and it was just like, wow. But we had a, an amazing time. And so I don't look at things up, and when I go to a church, I don't, I don't ask people what's happening, what's going on. I don't ask people what's going on in the church because I want to hear from the Lord, and I know the Lord will speak fluidly and clearly to me about what he wants to say. And it's more important about what he wants to say than it is about what I want to say. Because he can do more in two seconds than I could ever do in like two hours or two days, right? Amen. So if you'll stick with me, I'm going to give you exactly what I feel like the Lord wants to give you. Because when I was on the phone, I was down uh, on mission, I was driving around, my daughter and wife was actually taking pictures and, and, and they was all taking pictures. I was driving around like an Uber driver all through the city waiting to pick them back up. And, and uh, uh, I got on the phone with Pastor Robert. He had told me what happened to his, his eye and how uh, he had had the detachment and had the, the surgery and how he was going to be face down in 30 days. And instantly in my spirit, just like in your spirit when you heard it, I said, no, <laughs> no, 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 not, not even a chance. Even right now, in the name of Jesus, right now, we say no. Come on, church. No 30 days of recovery. No out 30 days. No need to be out. Jesus is a healer. By his stripes, we are healed. So, Father, we just pray for Pastor Robert right now in the name of Jesus. And we command these eyes to line up with your word that says that by Jesus' stripes, he is healed. So we call out to you, Pastor, be healed. We call out to you, eyes, to be healed right now 
In the name of Jesus, we plead the blood from the top of his head to the soles of his feet right now. Somebody say now. now. Right, now. right now. We don't wait. We're not going to hesitate. We are in full faith. We are believing. We've seen you heal before. So now do it again, Lord. Somebody say do it again. Do it again. See, it's not God, it's not hard for God to heal. It's not God hard for God to heal. God do it now. He's already done the healing by his stripes. By Jesus' stripes, we are healed. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You don't attack the body of Christ and get away with it. You don't. You don't attack the body of Christ and get away with it. The enemy can't just run rampant and attack the body of Christ and think he can just get away with it. No. He needs to understand the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. The power of God is a real thing. The supernatural is a real thing. And it is time that the body start to walk that out like it's true. Because it is true. But we just need to walk in it. Amen? There's no fear or intimidation. What do you got to be afraid of? If the Lord be with us, who can be against us? What do you have to be afraid of? Nothing. Nothing. Mm. So I don't shy away from a fight, a kingdom fight. Now a fist fight, I probably will, because those hurt. <laughs> we grew up on the streets, man. We, was, we fist fought since we was little, man. And everybody talks funny about fighting. No, fighting ain't funny, man. Like, fighting hurts. I don't care if you did win. <laughs> but in the spiritual, in the kingdom, we don't shy away from a fight, because the fighting in the kingdom doesn't hurt. The Lord fights for us and on our behalf. Who am I talking to today? Am I talking to some believers that believe this and are in power? Come on now. Yeah. Some of you in the room have been through some spiritual fights and you've seen the victory that God has and has given you. Mm. Who's seen a victory? Who's seen a victory, a fight that you thought you couldn't win but God stepped in? Yeah? Well, now is no different. Now is no different. The fight that you're in now is no different than the fight that was in the past. Only the circumstances has changed. God hasn't changed. You haven't changed. Circumstances are different, but the fight is the same. How about you come up here real quick, you in the light blue shirt with the pen. Yeah. You all right? Come on up here. Steve, come up and, and, and stand behind him if you would. Okay. The fight is the same. No, no, stand right there. Stand right there. Face me. Yeah. The fight is the same. Yeah, the God is, God is the same. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had some fights, right? So there is no fight. There is no fight that's too much for him. There's no difficulty that's too much for him. Okay? So our trust in him doesn't change. How many, there, there's been times in the past that you've been through certain things and you have seen God come through in miraculous ways. Am I right? Over and over again, you've seen God come through. This season and this time is no different. Season and this time is no different. You just have to continue to trust in Him. Put your hands out like this if you would. Can I minister to you? Yeah. Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus. God, let Him... Activate, we activate the mind of Christ and we shut down and shut off all worry, anxiety, and care. Worry, anxiety, and care, we crush you right now in the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus that draws all men unto God. Father, let the peace that passes all understanding, take a deep breath for me. The peace that passes all understanding, peace, 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 peace. Quiet this mind. Quiet this mind. Quiet this spirit. Quiet this spirit. Quiet this heart and this mind. Hmm. 
Just like you came in a still, small voice to Elijah, God. We just pray that you come in a still, small voice to this brother right now and bring the peace. Hmm. Peace, Lord. Somebody in the room say peace. Peace. Right. Peace is yours. Peace is yours. There's nothing, nothing in this world to be anxious about. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. You feel that? All right. Now listen, he don't have to fall out. and We don't have to have circus for him to receive something. Amen? <laughs> In your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. We are in a season and an hour that God is doing some miraculous things on the earth. He's been doing them for a long time, but there is a heightened awareness of what God is doing on the earth. There are miracle signs and wonders happening on a consistent basis. Exodus chapter 12. We are coming out as a ministry coming out of two tent revivals at the exact same time. Midsummer, I started feeling the the need to go after a tent. And so I I started calling around and I've got some friends in Houston and some friends in Dallas and they turned me on to a tent maker in Oklahoma, and uh, I called the tent maker in Oklahoma, and I started going through the process of ordering a tent and, and going to have them make us a new tent, a 40 by 80 tent. And so I'm on the phone with this guy, and we get right down to the place where uh, we are going to, he's going to email me, I'm going to sign the paper, scan it back, and we're done. I have bought a tent, a brand new tent. And he gets down to the point where he's going to email that. And he says, all right, well, we'll ship your tent in April of 2022. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You must have misunderstood me. Like, I can't wait till April to get a tent, man. Like, I need a tent now. He said, oh, there's no way. He said, Jay, there's no way, man. He started laughing. He's like, what are you thinking? He said, every tent manufacturer in the United States of America is backlogged until April or May of next year. Do you hear me? Every tent manufacturer in the United States of America is backlogged on back order because so many people are ordering tents. So he's a believer, and I asked him, I said, hey, is that, is that mainly because the body of Christ is buying up tents? And he says, absolutely, man. He said, we were at a big conference a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, we had some tent manufacturers there, and he said, we was all talking about it, that the body of Christ is buying up tents. Get ready. I'm telling you, get ready. So I was like, well, I'm sorry, but uh, we, can't, we can't wait till April. I'm going to have to look around. So that Friday night, I put it out uh, on Facebook. And within minutes, my Facebook messenger went crazy through a series of events that only God can do. By that uh, less than 24 hours, we had our first tent. Now, so on Sunday, my pastor brought me up and said, wanted me to tell the testimony of the tent. And so as I'm telling the testimony of the tent... Dr. Lester Summerall's grandson is a good friend of mine. He goes to church where I'm at. And uh, Lester was in the back. And and he heard me say, I need a tent. Shows how much he listens. No. (laughs) He he heard me say, I need a tent. And so it activated faith in him. And after service, he started making some phone calls. A couple days later, he calls me up and he says, hey, Jay. He said, I got you a tent, man. (laughs) I got your tent. I was like, what do you mean you got my tent? He says, I got your tent. I was like, I already got a tent. He's like, oh, I thought you said you needed a tent. I was like, no, I said I have a tent. I just got a tent. He says, well, now you got two. <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, on Monday, we got to go up to East Lansing and get your tent. I said, I can't. I got to go pick up the first one. He said, no, you got to tell the guy on the, that, that you'll pick up the first tent on Tuesday and the second tent in East Lansing on Monday. So in a week, we got two tents. Now, how many of you know, <laughs> there's not many of us on our team, man. Like, we're just a small-knit team. Like, 
You know, and I'm like, okay, God, uh, I don't, what are you doing? <laughs> One tent is enough. Amen. <laughs> but it's not enough. It's more than enough. And God is a more than enough God. Amen. Amen. What I meant is one tent is enough for our team to try to manage. I don't know how we're going to manage two tents. But we put one up on the south side of Chicago, on the edge of Inglewood. We would hear gunfire at night. Uh, uh, as we were trying to worship and sleep, we did a 24-hour intercession all through the night. We had baptisms like you wouldn't believe. We had deliverances. We had salvations. We had the body of Christ getting uh, uh, healed and, and delivered. And man, it was just amazing. Then God said, put the second one up at the same time. So we put a second one up on the south side of Elkhart over there by Pierre Moran on Mishawaka Road. And we put the second one up and we, we uh, had a feast. Both tents, we had a feast. We had worship going on at the same time, food going on at the same time. We had ministry going on at the same time and fellowship going on at the same time. And it didn't stop 24 hours a day. Uh, so the one in Chicago went for 30 days and the one in Elkhart went for 10 days. And then we took them down and put them in storage. But that started something or not started something. It continued something that had been moving in the spirit where God is doing something with miracle signs and wonders. I'm telling you, there's some amazing things happening. So we've come out of tent revival and into just uh, running the streets and, and still doing stuff. Um, but guys, let me tell you something. If you're willing, if you're willing, if you are a willing vessel and you're willing, there is no telling what God will do with you if you're willing. Do you understand? There's no telling. I looked for one tent. He gave me two tents. He said, that all right with you? I said, yeah, absolutely. I've also got friends calling me and saying, hey, man, we're uh, talking to so-and-so. We're talking to another guy and talking to this guy over here. And this guy's talking to this guy. And we got more tents coming for you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Somebody say, God is on the move. Somebody say, God, God. is on the the move. God is on the move. Hmm. God is on the move. Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 35. As you know that children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt at this point. They had been slaves for a really, really long period of time. God had Moses, this guy who didn't feel confident about himself. He really didn't know his identity. God calls this guy that doesn't know his identity out and through a burning bush gives him an anointing to go into Pharaoh and to say, hey, man, you better let the people of the children of Israel, you better let the people go. Moses says, man, I don't know if I can do that. He asked for Aaron. Aaron goes with him, right? And Aaron had a problem with people pleasing. So here's this guy that doesn't really know his identity and this guy that has struggled with people pleasing and they're going to go into the Pharaoh. God will use anybody. Just look up here. See, God will use me. God will use anybody. Now they went in. They told Pharaoh to let the people go. Pharaoh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He didn't want to let the people go. Eventually, we'll see right here that this is the moment when God starts to break everything off and they are released. Verse number 35. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent to them, they loaned them <clears throat> They loaned them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians, and the children of Israel sojourned or journeyed from Ramses to Succoth about 600,000 people, 600,000 on foot that were men beside children, 600,000 men. Right before God brings them out of bondage and out of slavery, 
God does something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He does something really crazy. He takes these slaves that were in Egypt. Everybody knows that they're slaves. And he sends them into the houses of the people of Egypt to borrow from them gold and silver and all of these materials, these, these high, high wealthy materials from the people. These slaves are going to go in and ask the people of Egypt if they can, hey, can I have some of your gold? Can I have your gold, man? Is that okay? Like, I'm a, I, listen, I know I'm a slave. I know you know me, but I, uh, is it okay? So that means that some of the slaves went into some of the guys that were their masters, right? And so here I am, and here's Stephen. So, so I've been working as a slave, and this is the master that is over me. And he goes in. I, God says, go to this guy? Yeah, go to that guy. Goes in, and I, now I have to ask him if I can have his gold and silver. That's nuts. Am I right? Am I the only person in the room that thinks that's crazy? That is crazy, man. Like, that's nuts. But God does it. God says, I'm, a, I'm about to do something. I'm about to release something. And I'm asking you right now to go in and I'm going to give you favor with the masters. I'm going to give you favor with your neighbors. I'm going to ask, I'm going to go in and you're going to get it. And they're just going to give it to you. Not because of you. Come on. You're a slave. They're not going to give it to you because you're a slave. They're not going to give it to you because of who your mom and dad is. They're not going to give it to you because of how strong you are. They're not going to. This guy that was the master did not say, hey, you've been a really hard working slave. Sure, I'll give you all my gold. No, that did not happen. So it did not have anything to do with who they were or their ability or what they could accomplish it had everything to do with what God was doing through them and the favor that he was giving them with the masters. Are you following me? All they had to do was be obedient and all they had to do was be willing, obedient and willing. Look at your neighbor and say, be willing and obedient. That's all they had to do. So they go in. And they get all the Egyptian stuff, all of it, not some of it. They bankrupted Egypt. <laughs> wow. Wow. Man, we need to shut the movies off and we need to get into the movies of the Old Testament. Uh, the word of God is powerful. Amen. There are some really awesome stories in here and they're not just stories that were created to put on a screen, they actually happened. This actually took place. Hmm. And the funny thing is that this happened right after the Egyptians were suffering because God had struck every one of the firstborn of Egypt. So they were mourning. The Egyptians were mourning. Funny thing is, God gets the Egyptians to the place where everybody in Egypt was like, I don't care what has to happen, but you guys need to leave. God can work something out in your situation so great that you feel like you're trapped, but the one that you feel trapped by will eventually get moved by God to say, done, I will leave you alone. If you trust God, God will open doors that no man can close, and God will close doors that no man can open. Go to 35, Exodus 35. Let's start in verse number 4. Now they go out into the wilderness. They've been out in the wilderness for a little while. They've got all this stuff. They've got all these resources. They go out in the wilderness. They're, they're, they're there. Moses is hearing from God off the mountain top. Exodus 35 and 4. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. This is the thing that God commanded. Saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. 
gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skin and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in a breastplate. Go down to verse number 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel left the presence of Moses. So Moses brings them all together and he says, this is what God is saying. God is saying that he wants to take, he wants you to bring these materials and bring them together to the congregation. This is the command of the Lord. This is what the Lord is saying. Then, the, then that whole congregation, that whole group of people, leave Moses, okay, to go get the stuff. But it says, then everyone came whose heart was stirred. And everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Now you guys know that, the, that God was putting together a tent of meeting out in the wilderness. He was going to build a tabernacle, and he was going to build the tabernacle without, with all of these resources. But the resources were in the hands of the people. Are you following me? The resources that God chose to build the tabernacle, the meeting place with, was in the hands of the people. All of the children of Israel held the resources. God went to Moses and told Moses to tell the people, bring those resources to the house. Bring those resources here so that I can build a tabernacle. They didn't know what a tabernacle was. They didn't know what a meeting place was. It come out of the heart of God. It was God's desire. The tabernacle was called the meeting place because it was the place where God would meet with the people. So God had a plan. God gave his plan to Moses. God, Moses set out and said, hey, bring all this stuff. The people had this stuff. But only those whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle meeting. For all its service and for all its holy garments, they came, both men and women, as many had a willing heart, and brought earrings and nose rings and rings and necklaces and jewelry of gold. That is, every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord, and every man with whom was found blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, red skin of rams, badger skins, he brought them. Everyone, somebody say everyone. Everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought the Lord's offering. And everyone, somebody say everyone, with whom was found acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands. That means they brought their giftings as well. They didn't only bring resources, but they brought their giftings. If they were able to do things like spin, spun yarn or spin yarn, they were able to do that. They brought that in. And all the women whose hearts were stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair, and rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate and the spices of oil for the light, the anointing oil and the sweet incense, the children. Now, remind you, this is six million people. <laughs> and everybody who was willing was bringing stuff. You follow me? Children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work, which the Lord, by the hand of Moses, has commanded to be done. Go down to verse, uh, chapter number 36, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I'm talking about. Chapter number 36, verse number 2. Then Moses called Bezael and Holiab, every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom. These guys that God had put in their hearts how to do things. So you have a worship leader. 
God has put in his heart how to do worship. He's taken what God has put in him. He's, he's played. He's learned how to play. He's learned how to sing. He's put in the work. And so now that gifting that comes out of him that he is to use, God calls that and he brings that in. Somebody who knows how to work with wood. Somebody who knows how to build homes. They come in and they bring their gift, their gifting. You follow me? So they continue to bring the, to him the free will offering every single morning. Every morning, not just on Sundays, not just on the day of the week. They brought a free will offering every morning. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses and saying, hey, hey, the people bring too much. The people bring much, much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. Wow. Holy cow. You're talking about taking them offering. The ushers is like, hey man, I don't know what to do. Like, there's too much stuff. <laughs> so Moses, verse number six, so Moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary and the people were restrained from giving. <laughs> don't bring no more, man. Don't bring no more. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. Somebody say, too much. Too much. Too much. Turn over to the book of Acts. Book of Acts. Beginning of the book of Acts, chapter number two, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And they were together, yeah? And there came from sound, heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind filled the house where they were sitting and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. If you say it the way they say it where I started off ministry where I got radically saved, the Pentecostals, they would say the Holy Ghost and fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost falls after Jesus is crucified and goes to heaven. The Holy Ghost falls. It was just like he promised. Go and wait on the tarry. Tarry and wait on the promise of the Father. And when he comes, he will, you will be empowered. Dunamis power, which translates into dynamite power, shall come upon you. And you shall be witnesses into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. After this dunamis dynamite power comes on you, You will run this earth forever in my power. <laughs> and miracle signs and wonders shall follow you in my power. Verse number 43. Actually, let's go up to verse number 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders, signs, and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continually, daily, somebody say daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, somebody say daily, those who were being saved. In the Old Testament, we just read a story about how God 
told these slaves to go in and take all this resource out of their, their captives' hands and to take it out into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, God called through Moses the people to bring all those resources in so he could make his plan come to pass, which was the tabernacle, the meeting place. You know, that's where the fire from heaven would come down. Cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And God started to develop in the people, in his people, that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the God of promise, that it didn't as much have to do with them as it did with a promise of a Canaan land, a promised land, that if you will do what I'm asking you to do, I'll take you to that land and you won't have to fight for it, that I'll give you that land. The victory will be mine. So he's building this tabernacle. It's in his head. He gives all the blueprints to Moses. It's a beautiful story that you might need to re, re, bring that back to your remembrance by reading it again. Because every single detail of the tabernacle came from the heavens. Every single detail came from God's mind. And God was telling Moses, my son and I, we were laughing one day because we saw Moses, you know, like up on this mountain. Now, remember, this is a dude that struggled with his identity, right? And he also had a guy with him that was a people pleaser, right? So when the people please, Aaron's down on the bottom and they're making a golden calf, Moses is up and all of a sudden he's in this like glory and there's this power that's happening, this fire and smoke and everything else. And, and, and we were laughing because it was like, I wonder if Moses was like trying to write it all down. <laughs> and what now? Now what goes with what? Well, the Bible doesn't say he wrote it down other than God took his finger and wrote on the tablets of stone. But God gave him this memory that he could memorize it and recite it. Now that's a pretty powerful thing to have, right? Photographic memory and to remember. But don't you think that a guy that has struggled with the ability to speak, now God brings him into the glory and when he's in the glory, now he has this memory that he can memorize all that God says, go down to the mountain, at the base of the mountain and say things accurately? I think God fixed his speech. What do you think? I think God fixed his memory, right? You get in the glory, no telling what God will fix. So here's this thing, the tabernacle in the wilderness where God's going to meet with them. But all of the supply, all of the material came out of Egypt. All of the material wasn't the slaves' material. They didn't work for this. They didn't build this. No, no. It came out of where they were at. They would not have had it lest God had given it to them. You follow me? Now fast forward, we look at the book of Acts, and the thing, that, the thing that blows my mind is the very first thing that God does is pour out His Spirit in the upper room, and then, pow, this deutimous power, dynamite power, the tongues of fire come on them, and they fall out of the upper room. Now they're like fumbling around. People think that they're drunk. Come on. People think that they're drunk, but they're like, Peter's like, no, we're not drunk, man. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, God says, I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And so all of a sudden, 5,000 people are saved in an instant because of the power of God. Well, it blows my mind. Right after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, God does something financially. He literally gets the apostles together and he says, listen, I, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go out into the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said before he left that that was the plan. And if that's God's will, God is going to finance that mission. You, you feel me? God is going to finance that mission. And so the fire from heaven comes in the upper room. They get baptized in the Holy Ghost. The power comes. They go out. 5,000 are saved every single day. Somebody is getting saved. And right in the midst of that, we see this where they bring the people together. And people go out and were in common and in one mind and in one accord. Sold their possessions. Brought them in. And the, and the apostles distributed them like the Holy Spirit told them to. Everything that was being done was being done under the unction of the Holy Spirit and God was telling them. 
I had this message on my heart. It's a message that the Lord told me to run with till the end of the year. I want you to run with this message to the end of the year. I preached a version of this last week. I prepped this for this week. And then I walk in here and I see this. I don't even know what it is. What is it called? Harvest, uh, harvest, offering. harvest offering. What is harvest offering? Harvest offering is the opportunity for uh, you to give to a specific mission or like to Retta or to Gospel Echoes or what to, okay. yeah. Okay, and so, so it's everybody in the congregation have an opportunity to give to missions. Right. Yeah, okay. Or whatever, yeah, whatever God's telling them to give to you. And, <laughs> all right, listen. I can't go any further. Philippians chapter 4. Let's go real quick to Philippians chapter 4. I got it. I, the Lord just like bumped me and said, go there. Because if you go there, they're not going to really get it. They're not, not that you're not going to get it. Somebody's getting it already. But if you don't, you're going to think that I went somewhere that I didn't go. A lot of times people think that preachers go places that they don't actually go. Hmm. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So when you have a need, when you have a need, you don't flip out about your need. You don't get anxious about your need, no matter if it's in business or in personal life. You don't, get, you don't go crazy about your need. You don't get stressed out. Matthew chapter 6, it says, Who, what man by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Right? So you don't flip out. You don't get worried. You don't get anxious. He says, don't get anxious, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That means that you go to God. You don't have to go to somebody else. You go to God. Let your request be made known to God, the peace of God which passes all understanding, which means, hey, you may not understand what God tells you to do, but that peace that comes on you will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, immediate, meditate on these things. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and God, the peace of God, will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at your last care for me, has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity to give. Not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned that whatever state I'm in to be content, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Let me read it one more time. Not, Paul is saying, while he's shackled and setting in prison. Do you understand? He is in prison. The gift could have come before he went to prison so that he could do what he was supposed to do. But the gift from Philippi did not come at the time when he was out. Actually, the gift from Philippi came when he was sitting in prison. <laughs> yeah. And this guy who's sitting in prison and was waiting on the, he wasn't waiting on these gifts. Do you understand? He wasn't waiting on the finances. He's telling them, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. He's not saying, thanks for your gift, but I didn't need it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, listen, I have found a, one version says I found a secret that no matter what's going on, I, I am content that my provider is God and not any of you. Amen. But what has happened, especially in our nation, and I'm going to go real quick and land this plane. What has happened in our nation is there's been something, and it's actually been a global thing, but there has been all of a sudden this thing where we had a group of individuals that the enemy kind of uh, kind of pushed, and I'm not going to say anybody any name because I don't have any names in my head that I'm thinking of. But people went around and they got it a little bit off. They got it wrong, or the enemy had implanted them in the church as wolves and in sheep's clothing. And so, for whatever reason, the enemy tried to attack the church by having certain individuals go through 
the church and suck finances out of the church and use those finances not for the kingdom but for personal gain. And then everybody, even the people that never gave ever, they were never givers. They started saying, see, that's why we don't give because this guy over here, he only wants money. And then they started the conversation about preachers want your money. All preachers, pastors want your money. But that was all from the enemy. I hope you know that. It was all from the enemy to shut down the operation of the body of Christ to provide for the body of Christ, but also to accomplish what God had originally set out of how we should operate financially. First and foremost, why did I read you that in Exodus? I read you that in Exodus to let you understand that nothing you have, no matter how many years you've worked, no matter how hard you've worked, no matter how many years of education you put in this head and knowledge that you put in this head, no amount of what you have done or what you have read or what you have studied has made you wealthy where you're at right now. God is the one who gives us the ability to get the wealth. And if you haven't settled that in your spirit, you're walking in a prideful stance where you feel like it's by your might and by your power that you've made the money. (laughs) And so God's like, all right, well, then go do what you do. And then the minute your business fails or the minute your job fails, rolls up, you're going to want to go to God and say, hey, what just happened? I thought we were doing... And God's like, we had not been doing this for years. You have been doing this. I couldn't do anything because you did it all. But now you're going to run to me and it's okay that we run to him because he's a loving father that's going to mop it all up. He's going to clean it all up. He's going to lick our wounds for us. He's also going to pay for everything. He's going to provide for us because he's a father that he loves us. No matter if we mess up. But if you're walking around thinking that these hands made it happen, I'm telling you, you're walking around in pride. I had no idea you guys were taking up an offering. Whether you believe that or not is not up to me. Take it up with the Lord because I didn't know that. I hadn't had a conversation with anybody. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the Lord is trying to speak to this congregation and to this body about moving into the spirit financially. Moving in the spirit financially. Moving in the spirit financially. (laughs) I said moving in the spirit financially because there's a plan. Listen, if you don't understand that the enemy right now has a plan on the earth, we need to talk. <laughs> you might be asleep. I don't know. But the enemy has a plan on the earth. Do you understand? Yep. And the enemy is financing his plan across the board. He's using some of the most wealthy individuals on the planet to finance his plan. That's how it works. But he's also having all the other common people finance the plan as well by by sending things in and all give to this, all do this, or all do that. Okay. In the book of Exodus, it talks about those who had a willing heart. Moses stood up and said, okay, listen, this is what I hear the Lord saying. Let's take up this offering to build the tabernacle. And then they left. Only those that came back were the ones that had a willing heart. That's it. Not everybody came back. Those that had a willing heart. Those that actually felt a, what I call a resonate in the spirit to come back and to give to the mission, to what God was doing. This is why they came back with a willing heart. They trusted what was said. But then they went back to their tents and they got and had a conversation. They they tried to figure out, is this God? Once they had this identification that it was God, then they got the stuff together that they had in their possession and they brought it in. Book of Acts. Book of Acts. Funny thing is, the book of Acts, the apostles didn't have to ask. The the Spirit of God compelled men and women to go and to sell things and to bring it in. So how did they do this? They're at their house and they're saying, uh, uh, what do you hear God saying, uh, hon? What, what, what do you think we're saying? They're at dinner, they're eating. And they're like, what is God saying for us to give, right? And then pretty soon they hear from God 
They get an identification of it. They go get what God tells them to get. And they bring it where God tells them to bring it. You follow me? I'm almost done. Dude, I wish I could take all afternoon. They say, man, you, you, they're like, Jay, you take a long time, man. Like, I'm so, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. There's just so much to tell. God has literally restructured me and my wife. They say, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, hey, Jack, I did that. I was raised in steel mill country where they said, see these hands? If it don't come through these hands, it ain't coming. There are no free meals. So I had a work ethic. I was taught by grandpas and great grandpas and uncles and great uncles. And my mom was a waitress. She worked double shifts all the time as a single mother trying to wait tables and do stuff. She had a great work ethic. So I was raised up in a great work ethic. When I got into drywall in 94, man, I was working so hard. I was like, well, I don't have no friends here in Kansas City because I just moved to Kansas City. So I don't have no friends. Well, what are you going to do then? Well, I'm just going to go to work. So I would work during the day. I'd get off. I'd hang out for a little bit, go get me a bite to eat. And then I'd go at night and I'd go work at night. And man, when I started cashing the checks, I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't need sleep. I'm good. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm, don't worry about me. I'm good. <laughs> and as nine turned into 12, nine dollars turned into 12 dollars. As 12 dollars turned into 15 dollars, 15 dollars turned into 25 dollars. I was like, whoo, -hoo. <laughs> let me work, man. But I was also saved and I didn't understand that it was a workaholism that was driving me because I had a broken identity. I was an orphan son. I didn't feel like my identity was right. And so every time I was trying to work, every pair of pants that I bought, every pair of shoes that I bought, every watch I had, every shirt that I had, I was like, man, it's got to look a certain way. I've got to have a certain shirt because i got to show people that I have money. I came from nothing. <laughs> and then I did that in ministry. I became a workaholic in ministry. I wasn't trusting God for my finances. I was running as hard as I possibly could. I was trying to make it. I was trying to make it happen. It wasn't until about, about 10, not even that. It was probably about 2010, 2011. God got a hold of me, man. I had Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you all over everything. It was my life verse. I had it all over everything. I could quote it off the, I mean, so fast you could, couldn't even see straight. I almost was able to quote it backwards. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. And all of a sudden, God stopped me in my tracks and said, Hey, Jay, you don't believe that. I was like, what? He's like, you don't believe that. I was like, well, man, I hope I believe it because, like, it's my life verse. I hope, I hope, I hope I do. What do you mean? And he said, nothing. How many of you have had God, like, radically shake you and then go silent? <laughs> man. So, like, six months, five months, six months roll by. All of a sudden, <laughs> I find myself one morning brushing my teeth, right, in the, in the morning, getting ready for work. <clears throat> and I'm brushing my teeth and I'm so upset because he hadn't said nothing. I don't know what to tell people. I don't know. I mean, I'm going through this transition. I don't know what the transition means. God's kept so completely silent and I'm brushing my teeth in the mirror that morning and, and all of a sudden I just start crying. Yeah, if you know me, like I'll cry in a heartbeat, you know, like I'm crying. Oh, why won't you tell me? Like, what, why did you leave me? <laughs> like, you know, like children of Israel in the wilderness. Have you left us out here to just die? Feeding us this manna and stuff? I don't even like manna, right? Okay. So I'm brushing my teeth, I'm bawling my eyes out, and I'm like, man, this is rude. This is, this is, this is terrible. Why will you not tell me? And as clear and as soft and as nice, he says, you have your hands all over everything. I can't do nothing. I was like, whoa. That made all the sense in the world, man. I understood it, right?
right? I understood it. I was like, oh, that's what you mean. I said, well, I don't know how to take my hands off of it. Went out to my wife, and I love wives, man, our wives, because went out to my wife, and I told my wife, and she's like, well, yeah, I could have told you that. <laughs> so I started to take my hands off of it. I was like, I don't know how to do this. Matthew chapter 6, he says, listen, go to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to tell you. He said, he said, take no thought for what you should wear or what you should put on. That's how the Gentiles, the people who are not in covenant, that's how they live their life. And I was like, oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. How am I not going to take care of what I put on or what I wear? I got kids. <laughs> how am I not going to take thought? I said, God, you're going to have to explain this to me because this doesn't make any sense. You know, God is okay with you getting raw and real and transparent. Amen, somebody. Amen. He already knows what you're thinking anyhow. He already knows. He knows how frustrated you are. He knows how upset you are. But I said, yeah, I, I said, listen, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to take no thought for what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to put on. I'm supposed to work hard. And he says, He's, you got to trust me, Jay. You got to trust me. You got to trust me. So all of a sudden he started, I started taking my hands off of everything. I stopped doing stuff. People thought I was burnt out. I had preacher friends that was like, man, are you burnt out? Are you okay? Burnout's bad. I understand. I was like, man, I am not burnt out. I just don't know what to do. He hadn't told me what to do. And all of a sudden he took me, uh, part of it, he took me to where Mary was at the wedding feast. And Mary told the disciples, whatever he tells you to do, do it. How many of you are familiar with that? Jesus is right there saying, hey, stop. Like, mom, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be doing nothing right now. She's like, and, and the funny thing is, he learned, all right, you ready for this? Moms, get ready. Watch this. He learned how to minister because he's just like his mom. When you fast forward and you see Jesus, right? Jesus is having conversation with people and it sounds sometimes like he don't even hear what the person said because the person said something and he don't even talk about it, right? Like the guy at the pool of Bethesda, he says, do you want to be made whole? And the guy says, well, you know, I don't have God to put me in. I don't have this. And every time I try to get in, you know, somebody else, well, he don't even talk about that. He's like, well, then pick up your bed. <laughs> he don't go into what the guy said. So there's Mary and Jesus at the, at the wedding feast, right? <laughs> Mary's like, hey, listen, we got we to gotta do something about this, this situation that's going on right here. He's like, mom, shh, it, it ain't time. And she says, hey. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. <laughs> and she didn't even listen to him. <laughs> like, so, it, yeah, anyways, that's where he learned it at. So, look, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So I was like, all right, well, then I'll just do that. I thought I was doing that. I thought I was doing that, but come to find out I was doing a lot of good things that sounded good, but they weren't God things. And I said, okay, God, well, I just want to do what you're asking me to do. And man, I was, I, 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 I planted a church. I've done all these things. I was fumbling around. Man, if you knew me at that time, you probably thought, golly, this guy has no idea what he's doing. And that was right. I didn't know. I was, I was being transformed, do you understand, into doing what he asked me to do. I'm going to end this with this, but I'm also going to transition into something else. If you have to leave, I'm going to let you loose. But here's the thing. Watch this. If you have to leave. What am I saying? I'm saying a couple things. And if you're taking notes, write it like this. Number one, everything you have that God has given you is God's. It's all His. We are stewards of His stuff. Everything you have that God's given you is God's. You didn't have the ability to get it before he gave you the ability to get it. Number two, every ability that you have is God's. Even if you learned it, even if you studied it, he gave you the ability to learn it and to study it. Every ability you have is God's. He has given you the ability to steward, be a good steward over your abilities. Number three, 
listen to what he tells you to do. Listen to what he tells you to do in every area. You want to stop being so stressed out about your finances? Start asking him what to do with them. You want to stop being so stressed out about uh, leaving a retirement or leaving a legacy or leaving a... Start asking him what your retirement should look like. Start asking him what your legacy to, should look like for other kids, for your children, and for your grandchildren. <coughs> you got to start asking God in every single situation. I'm talking about in the morning when you wake up, you ask the Lord what to do. I'm talking in the afternoon, we can't figure it out. You got to ask the Lord what to do. That's what we do. I'll be in a store. I'll be in the raw, uh, raw store, uh, Christmas shopping for my kids. All of a sudden, I look across the room about where that guy in the blue back there, wave your hand, is sitting. And I'll see this guy, and he's got tattoos on his face. And I'm like, oh, wow, that, okay, okay. And I'll look away, and the Lord's like, don't look away. And I'm like, all right. Well, he said, hey, I want you to give such and such. And Well, I'll tell you. I want you to give $100 to that guy. I was like, okay. That's cool. So I look at my wife, and I'm like, uh, I'll be right back. And she's like, where are you going? I was like, well, I got to go to the bank. And she's like, okay, see ya. And I'll, I'll take off, and I'm like, well, don't let him leave. Like, I see him in his car, and he's got his kids and his, his girlfriend or whoever. Like, don't let him leave. So I'm rushing out, you know, because I don't carry a lot of cash on me, you know. And me and the Lord are trying to work all that out because every time I, seems like every time I carry a lot of cash on me, I, I empty my wallet <laughs> and give it to somebody else. Like, and, and my wife is like, hey man, uh, it's okay if God tells you to do it. I'm like, yeah, God told me to do it. All right. She's like, well, how much did you, you got any cash? No. Oh, you gave it all away. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you do that at? So I don't keep a whole lot of cash. Maybe I should, but I ran over to the, so I walk outside, and there's my truck in the parking lot, and I see this huge rainbow. I'm like, wow, that's awesome, man. Rainbow is promise. Rainbow is not pride. Get out of here. They stole that. Rainbow is promise. It's ours. It's promise. It's a promise. So as I'm going to get money out of the bank, and I'm looking out, I'm like, oh, there's the promise. I'm on the right track now. So I get in my car, and I'm you know, racing across the parking lot. I go over to the bank. I get to the ATM. I get my card. Get the hundred dollars out. And I'm pulling out. And as I pull out, it's a double rainbow. When I got to the bank, it was a single rainbow. When I got the money out, it's a double rainbow, double portion. So I go back. I get in Ross. I'm like, hey man, don't let the guy leave. Where's he at? So I'm walking all over the store. I'm hunting this guy, and all of a sudden he's going into the checkout lane. And I'm like, oh, don't leave. So I go up to him, I tell him, I, I, you know, I'm just like, hey, are you a believer? He's like, oh, I don't know. And his girlfriend's like, well, I've been trying to get him to go to church. I was like, all right, well, listen, this is no strings attached. Your father loves you so much. He wanted to bless you. And I ran across his bank to get you money out to, to pay for, for whatever it is you're doing. He says, God, I said, God wants to bless you on Christmas and bless your children on Christmas. And I said, there's no strings attached. He just loves you. So now we're, we're connecting or whatever, you know, online or on Facebook because I gave him my contact information. But there was no strings attached. God was a blessing, but I had to do it right then, right now, because if I would have hesitated, I would've, they would have left. I'd have never found them. So you got to stop hesitating in some of this stuff. God tells you to do stuff, and you're like, well, that sounds really crazy. Yeah, it's probably God. Because <laughs> God has this wild imagination. He's, he's wild. He's, it's, it's just wild. What do you think? So you do it, you're like, but you can't hesitate because if you hesitate, you'll miss opportunities. You'll miss tons of opportunities to bless people that God, your fathers want to bless people. And through blessing him, watch this, I go to church the next morning. I'm preaching a message. And all of a sudden, after the message, after the altar call, whatever, I, I, I get over and a brother of mine comes next to me and he says, hey, he says, I got a question for you. He said, uh, how much did you bless that brother with? Because I ended up telling the testimony there. I was like, well, I think it's $100. So he reaches in his wallet, he gets out $200 bills, and he puts $200 bills in my hand, and he said, God told me to double whatever it was you gave to him. <laughs> and he says, you should have given him $1,000. <laughs> I was like, you better be careful, dude. Next time I'll break your bank. <laughs> He's like, you won't break mine. Mine's in heaven. 
Listen, I don't want to beleaguer people, but here's the thing. I'm after people. I personally am after people that God is speaking to about this very subject right here. And I'm going to do it all the way through December. I mean, i got trips planned. We're going to Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're going to Orlando. Going to all this stuff. But while I'm in this region, God is releasing a word in this region about spiritual, supernatural finance. And it's not about me coming with a... Let me, let me, here, here's what I do. I kick the devil, I lean back, and I kick the devil straight smack dab in the head, okay? You're like, well, somebody says, well, your leg couldn't go that high. I don't have to have my leg high, because he's down here. <laughs> he's under my feet, dude. So let me kick the devil in the chest. A pastor didn't call a missionary didn't call me out on the street to come in to help him bring money into the church. That didn't happen. Stop thinking all that. That didn't happen. I didn't know what was going on in here. I knew what God told me to bring. I brought this and boom, something's happening. Okay? All the increase in the book of Acts comes in and goes out, comes in and goes out, comes in and goes out. Blessed to be a blessing is, is the residual that happens to you when you're involved in being the distribution center. I'm going to teach that here in just a few minutes. So I'm going to cut everybody loose, but I want to know something. If you have been struggling right now, if you've been struggling, and you have been afraid that you would not have enough, and even this week, you've been like, man, I just don't know where it's going to come from. I don't want you to wait. I want you to stand to your feet right now. That's you. Anybody in the house? Yep. 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 It's okay, guys. We're in a safe place, man. We are in a safe place. Let me tell you something. The enemy tries to attack us all the time with stuff. I don't think you ever really fully are perfected in it until you get to heaven. We're trying to. We're believing. We're strong. But we do have times where we're like, whoa. So here's what I want to do. You guys, on this section right here, if you would, turn around and lean your hands. Stretch your hands towards them. You guys, stretch your hands towards them right there. Okay? <coughs> If you can, stretch your hands this way. Steve, maybe jump back there. And, and, and Bubba, if you will do this. Hey, buddy, right here. If you will go lay hands on him. Yeah. I'm not going to pray a crazy prayer. I'm not going to go nuts. I'm just going to say something very simple. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. The truth of the matter is, my God shall supply all your needs according to His, by His riches and glory. Okay? All your needs. All your needs supplied. So, Father, thank you for your word that says that you will supply our needs if we let our needs be known and we're thankful to you. So, Father, I pray right now, right now, Right now, you are making, you have already been making a way where there seems to be no way, but you're making a way right now that every need supplied, every need supplied in their lives, you're showing them, you're giving them the peace that passes understanding. You're showing them exactly what it is that you're doing in their life that's bringing it to pass. God, every need supplied. Every need supplied. Now, those of you that are standing, Say, Father, thank you that you have shown me in the past how you want to meet my need. Father, thank you for meeting my current need. Father, forgive me for ever doubting you. Father, forgive me for allowing fear to creep in. And from here on out, I'll walk in faith. I trust you, God. I trust you. Mm. Father, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, we come against doubt and fear and unbelief right now. 
And we just pray for faith to reign and rule in their life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Somebody give the Lord a hand real quick. <laughs> Praise his name. I'm not going to all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut down. I didn't even talk to Steve about this, but I just thought about this. Here's, here's, here's what happened. I, I know there's people in here that have questions. There's people in here that are kind of like, well, I heard that. Uh, I've, I've heard that before, but, but here, I, I want to uh, I, I have a, a conversation with you, okay? And so from this corner to that corner in these first couple rows, if, if you're here and you're like, man, I need as much of this as I can possibly get my hands on. I need some answers. I need to know some things. When we get done, when they get done shutting down, okay, I want you to fill up these front rows because I'm going to spend some time with you because I do have some crazy, crazy stories about how God is providing. Paul told the Philippian church, listen, I don't have need. Uh, 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 of I, I, my, my, all my needs are supplied by God. And I'm going to tell you publicly right now, okay? We do have partners. We do have people to give. And man, it is, it is amazing. Is it in the crazies? No, it's not in the crazies. We do exactly what God's called us to do. But I do not personally take up an offering because God told me not to. I do not ask for partners because God told me not to. I do not ask for anything across the board because God told me not to. God said, ask me. So I'm like, all right, I'll ask you. He said, let, let your needs be made to me. And so it, it becomes really, it, it, these is some friends of mine are in here, and, and you may have seen it. Like, it becomes really uncomfortable when somebody says, hey, it, what, is, is, it, how's this working? How are you paying for these tents? How you doing? I'm like, well, it's God. Yeah, I know that, but like, you know, uh, what, what, what is it that you, what is it that you need? What is it that you, it's kind of difficult, Steve, because it's like, well, I'm not supposed to ask you for anything. I'm asking the Lord, and if the Lord prompts you to give, then you give. You follow me. But I'm not the only one he's doing that with. He, he, he's doing that with a lot of people because he wants us to get to a place where we trust. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking an offering. I didn't preach this message to take up an offering, to, to stir your heart in giving so that you could give to me. I'm not. I'm telling you there's something God is wanting to do with you that has very little to do with me and has everything to do with his plan and his will. The problem is we had so many going around that would preach a message like this with the intentions of stirring your hearts up so that you could give a big offering so that they could go back in the back and count it and then cut a check so that they could go on down the road and ultimately their trust was in that offering and not in God himself. I'm not cutting them down. I'm just saying that's what, how it got off. But God's recalibrating it now. And just because some people got off, I said it before, just because some people got off, doesn't mean that it's all broken. God's still doing the same thing. I love you for those of you leaving. I love you, appreciate you. If you want to stay longer, you can. But I'm so thankful you trust me. Go hear from God and then bring, wherever he's telling you to bring, bring to God what he's requiring. And watch what God will do. Amen.